this service, but it does my heart really good right now because a young lady who's a part of our youth group wants to come up and, and share her testimony a little bit with the church. So if you'd make Peyton welcome as she comes, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm really nervous about this, but God laid it on my heart to tell you all this because I think it would do good for people my age or even people older than me. But to be honest, I don't know why I'm up here other than the words in my head saying, share your testimony. I was raised up in this church for most of my life. My mom is a Christian woman. My dad is now and always was, but he was a drunk for, most, for several years of my life. I told God that if my dad would stop drinking and start playing with me, that I, would be, I, that I would follow him. Well, God knew that was a lie, even though I was young. And I went on to get baptized because that's the right thing to do, right? But I did it for all the wrong reasons. But I, Derek was preaching and said, God calls us to have childlike faith. But, I, but that don't mean act a fool or anything in Walmart, begging your parents for anything. But it does mean follow God without a doubt in your mind that he is your one and only Savior. I'll give you an example. My sister's eight. She said, I want to be like Jesus. Now, she has a need and a want to be like Jesus. And I know she wasn't lying. To be honest, we all need to like, be like her in her faith with God. Although no one but my best friend knows this, at least I think I told her this. I was bullied because of my faith. And I shared my faith for a long time until one of my good friends started bullying me. I turned on God and said, why would you let someone make fun of me if you loved me so much? But then I become friends with someone I call one of my good friends now. He goes here to this church. I don't think he's here today though. This kid convinced me to come back to church so we could see each other more. But now I convince people to come to church. My best friend is getting baptized because I brought her to the youth rally. One of my friends convinced her parents to come to, ch come to church. And now I call upon myself to shine Jesus' light, walk the way he walked, and think the way he thought. But before I can do that, I must get rid of my worldly ways, my judgmental mind, selfish heart, and my doubtful mind to, to God and Jesus. If anyone is saying in their head that they are nobody and they are not worthy of God's love, then let me tell you a secret. God doesn't care who you are, what you've done, or anything about you. Because you are a child of God. He created you. He knows everything about you. There is no line to God. If you think that you want to be saved or you want to follow him there, and you don't know how to, start by repenting. Repenting is just falling on your knees and begging God of his forgiveness because you know you are a sinner. And God don't need to hear no wimpy beg. You have to mean it, and if you don't mean it, then he will know. There's no line to God. I may seem young to know this or too young to understand, but I can tell you this. You are not too young or too old to learn about God. I see toddlers through 12-year-olds 12, 12 learn about God almost every Sunday. They love it. I used to hate church, but seeing those little kids made you make me love church. So I'll tell you right now, follow God, love God, and walk the way he walked.
Sometimes when I'm downstairs talking to the kids, they're actually when the kids are talking to me. I ask them something about, you know what sin is? And when they answer me, I'm overwhelmed. I don't even know what to do with myself. But I, I told them before, I wish I could get you to come upstairs and tell everybody that. He said, see, I don't like mentality of God. They just, they grasp it in such a simple way that it doesn't have to be complicated. It's okay to be simple. That they know they need God. That's the only way. They don't have to understand all the answers. All they got to know is I need He said, I can ask. That's pretty simple. If you bow with me, I want to open some word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you this morning. I want to thank you for faith and her getting out of her comfort box. And I know that's not her personality. Lord, I know that she did not want to do what she had came to do today. But Lord, that I sit there and listen. For. I got nothing left of my own. And if I got anything on my own, Lord Jesus, I probably don't need it. So I ask you to help me lay it down at your feet. Lord, all I want is you. And I pray today that you would hide me behind the cross. And I pray today that you'd help us be honest. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we began to talk about a passage of Scripture from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. And they're going to shoot that up on the wall in just a second. And Jesus quotes this passage in Luke 4 of himself. And I just want to simply read this passage of Scripture to you. And uh, let's listen to this right here because we're going to talk about this this week and next week. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now last week we talked about the good news to the poor. you know, And we talked about who that was. And the poor really has absolutely nothing to do with your worldly definition of poor. Zero to do with it. It has nothing to do with money. And everything to do with spiritual poverty. To realize that you're spiritually bankrupt on your own. And really have absolutely nothing to plea bargain with God with. You know, uh, Peyton done a great job of explaining how worldly religion looks like. God, if you'll do this, I'll do that. Like, like God really needs something you got. You know, right? Like, God, if you'll do this, I'll quit cussing. All right? If you'll do it, I'll never look lustfully again. You know, I'll quit drinking. I'll go to church every time the doors are open. We'll tell God anything to get what we want, right? But like he really done it for that. I mean, what do I have that he needs? I, I have nothing to plea bargaining with. When I come to God and laid myself down at his feet, what did he have but brokenness? The poor, the good news of the poor. And today we're going to talk about that he come to bind up or mend up the brokenhearted. Now, I want you to think about this because I've been pondering on this. Man, I, I, I'm a note. I, I think good with an ink pen in my hand, all right? I cannot think unless if I think something and I don't write it down, it's gone. Now, here's the thing. If I write it down, I can't read it back anyway, but I'll remember it from now on. People say, why don't you read your notes? Because I can't read my notes. Uh, that's the problem. But I remember it if I write it. If I have something about my hand and my brain, it has to get there. through. I don't know. But as I was sitting in my chair this week thinking about brokenness and brokenheartedness, man, I was making notes like a madman. Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted. And today, I just want to get real here. Like, I don't have any kind of spiritual all that you're going to go away and say it from this place today saying, never knew that. Probably not. But I pray today that we can get real in this room and we can talk about some things that Jesus came to fix. And I want you to think for a minute about brokenness. You know, Jesus came to mend the brokenhearted. But no prideful person 
lets anybody else know that they're broken. Have you ever noticed that your pride wants to cover up your junk, your mess? You want to act like you got it all together? Yeah, I mean, we want to put our makeup on before the world sees us. You know, I mean, we want to get ourselves all prettied up before we really come to church. As a matter of fact, we probably show our true colors less in our religion than any other part of our life. Think about that for a minute. Why is that? It's like the one time when we ought to be real, we're a total fake. And, and, and that's hard to get past, right? Because we were kind of trained to do that. It, 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 it's kind of like that old thing that says, you don't, you don't talk about your feelings at church. You don't talk about politics at church. You don't talk about religion at church. What? Religion something a man doesn't ex- discuss. That's why we are where we are. Right? Because we're too prideful to be broken. And so this morning, I, I just want to begin by thinking about some things that Jesus came to fix of our brokenness. And the first thing that I want to talk to you about is shame. I think shame is at the top of the broken list, okay? Shame. And, 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 and there's all kinds of different avenues of shame, but the one thing I want to start talking about this morning something that I run into a lot, and not in my own life, just in my own life, but in a lot of lives, is that we are ashamed of the things we used to do. Right? Now, now, now there's a good thing there, a good thing that I pray. Never, you ever heard the song, Heal the Wounds and Leave the Scars? Okay, I never, ever, ever want to forget where God found me. Because if I do, I might end up back there, Okay? So I never, ever want to forget where he found me. But at the same time, I carried that shame long enough. Okay? That that shame is something that Jesus died to take away. Let let me get out a a passage of Scripture here that I want to read to you. And and it comes from 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 24 and 25. And and I want you to wrap your mind around these words right here that, that Jesus done something on the cross. For instance, when you were in Sunday school class, if your teacher would have asked you, why Jesus died on the cross, what would you say? Now, don't lie to me and give me some big complicated answer. I'm talking about in a little bitty kid Sunday school class, why Jesus died on the cross? He died for our sins. That's always been the answer, right? He died for our sins. But what did he want to do with it? I mean, he died for our sins, and that's so true. But folks, he didn't die for our sins so we could keep it. It's like, that's what was killing us to start with. He didn't pay for our sins so we could take it back home with us. He paid for our sins so we didn't have to pack it anymore. Listen what the First Peter chapter 2 and verse 24 says. I'm going to read it to you right there. It says, uh, well, somebody took First Peter right out of my Bible. I'll find it here tonight. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 through 25, it says this. Him, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And I'm going to say that one more time. He, he took our sin, he bore our sin on the cross. Now, this right here bothers a lot of people, but Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus became sin. Oh, man, people get all up in the air and say, wait a minute, buddy. My Jesus never sinned. No, he didn't, but you did. And so he had to become your sin so that you could become his righteousness. And that's exactly what, so let, let me put it to you in a little easier way to understand He took the consequences of your sin so that you could take the reward for his righteousness. Now get that in your head. He took the consequences of your sin and gave you the reward for his righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Now I hear this sometimes on the radio like they'll be talking about this guy that made this terrible crime, done this terrible thing. And they'll say, he was sentenced to five life sentences. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in all my born days right there. Like after he's dead the first time, 
It's no punishment to him to leave him in prison anymore. Now it punishes the other people to have to smell him. But he don't care. He's dead. You cannot punish a dead man in this life. You understand something? When he is, you can only punish one life. When he's paid with that life, he has nothing else to pay. It's paid. Jesus came and died for our sin, the Bible says, once for all. When a man is given his life, it's done. There is no more debt to be paid. Jesus gave one perfect life in exchange for our messed up life. And that's what we owed God was one perfect life. You can't be asked for that. That's all you had. And Jesus gave that one perfect life. And the reason he done that was to give you again his righteousness. Folks, let me tell you something. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your shame and your sin if you're in the blood. Right? The, the, now listen, the one who judges you can't see through the blood. He doesn't remember your sin it is far as from the east is from the west, right? So why would you carry a shame when the one who judges you sees perfection? Think about that for a minute. Why would I carry a shame for something he's already paid for? And so if you're here today and you have confessed your sin to God and you have repented of your sin and sought to live a new life, and you are wore out constantly by the life you used to live, I want you to tell Satan to take a long walk on a short pier because Jesus already paid for that. Right? It's like, listen to this verse. Psalm 51, 17. Psalm 51, 17, it says, let me read it. I can't quote it. I could get close, but I might mess it up. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken in spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. Listen to this. The sacrifice that God wants from you is a broken and contrite heart. You know what the word contrite means? I didn't have to get Webster's help. But the word contrite in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary says this. Deeply afflicted afflicted with grief for having offended God. Listen, that, that's what God wants out of me is for me to realize that I have sinned against Him and Him alone. All right? So the thing that you're most ashamed of, who are you ashamed of finding out? Because nobody on this earth is going to judge you. Not one single soul. The one who's going to judge you is the one who died for you. I mean, think about that for a minute. The one who's going to be sitting in a judgment seat is the one who died for me. And all he asks of me is to be deeply grieved because I have offended him. And so today I want to ask you something. If shame is a major problem in your life, who are you ashamed of offending? Because if you're ashamed that you offended God and you have confessed your sin and you have been faithful and trying to live His way, He don't even know what you're talking about anymore. Did you hear that? He don't even know what you're talking about. You keep saying, God, please forgive me of what I did 25 years ago. And God said, you know what? I forgot that 25 years ago when you asked for forgiveness for it. I love the song that says, Jesus, can you show me just how far the east is from the west? And the end of the song says, I know how far from one scarred hand to the other. But you know, some people's shame is not just the shame of their own sin. Some people's shame is what somebody else done to them. Now, I talk to these people all the time, lots of times. I mean, and they're so ashamed of rejection and abuse, abandonment. And they have got a sense of shame and unworthiness because somebody somewhere along the line didn't value them enough to stick with them. 
or they didn't value them enough to appreciate them. And they abused them and they took advantage of them and they they done terrible things to them. And now in their life, they got this overwhelming shame and a lack of self-value. And they carry it every day of their life. And Satan's right there whispering in their ear, they're no good, they're no good. And they're just, golly, they got this shame all over them. And here's the problem. They're trying to get the world to set a good value on them. They're trying to convince Satan they're worthy. They're trying to convince their self they're worthy. But you know how much God said you were worth? Everything he held dear. I want you to think about that for a minute. I asked you this last week. How important to you is your junk? I mean, you've got some junk at home that's major and important, right? Clutter! One man junks, another man's treasure is as true a statement as anything in the world. And you got some stuff in your, up in your place that you would just absolutely wouldn't know how to live without. You don't know what to do with it either, but you wouldn't know how to live without it. Right? We, we spend all of our time reorganizing. And I don't know about you, but we got so much junk that no matter how you organize it, it still looks like junk. You know what I'm talking about? And we, we love it, and we say, well, I don't know. You can't take that. We might need it. Right? And, and, and the only way that we would possibly get rid of it is if we realized how little it meant. And if somebody come in there and they said, I'm taking this, and I said, no, you ain't neither over my dead body. And they said, all right, we'll leave it and take one of your kids. I'd say, well, then take the junk. Because what in the world good is that to me? If I got to sit here in the middle of it and lose something that precious. And God loved you so much. Can you imagine how uncomfortable the throne of heaven is when you're watching your son be ripped apart with a flagella? You know, comfort is a lot about atmosphere. You can be so uncomfortable in the most comfortable places. You ever notice that in life? Let me give you an example. King Darius lived in a palace. And he commanded, because of a lot of political leverage, he commanded Daniel to be put in the lion's den. Now, I love this story. And the Bible says that King Darius went to his palace and he refused his supper and he refused his entertainment and he spent the night sleepless in a palace. You ever been uncomfortable in an otherwise comfortable place? And, and Daniel is in the lion's den snuggling up with the kitty cats. That's the truth. And the next morning, King Darius can't wait till it gets daylight. You ever had them kind of nights? I want to tell you something. Satan's more powerful at night. Is it, can anybody testify to that? Man, have I had some long nights. I've had nights so long that I would give anything if the sun would just come up right now because I am sick and tired of wrestling with this. Up and down and fighting and praying and just, Lord, have mercy, let it be morning. You know what I'm talking about? And King Darius couldn't wait till it had been morning and he run down there and he said, Daniel, has your God? Been able to spare you from the mouth of the lions. And I could just see Daniel down in there right now. What'd you say? Man, if you would have just given me another air up in here, I was sleeping good. This is the softest line I ever laid on right here. Everybody ought to have one of these. Right? I mean, Daniel is cool as it can be. And Darius is hopeless and restless and sleepless. And folks, it has nothing to do with their accommodations and everything to do with their heart. And here, if you're here today and you're just completely restless because Satan is screaming shame in your ear, and, and a lot of times shame is not something that you brought on yourself but something somebody else gave you, then let me tell you something. God said you were worth a son, and he's given you eternal life. And if you're his, then you're a child at the king and there waits for you a place at the father's table and a room in the father's mansion. Now here's the thing. 
And sometimes we get our theology from songs, right? And the Bible says, In my father's house are many mansions in the King James. In other translations, it says many rooms. Do you think you're going to have your own mansion when you get to heaven? Because I don't want one. You know, some people's building them a cabin in the corner of glory land. But my room's in the Father's house. In my Father's house is many rooms. And I'm going to make one of them for you, Jesus said. Woo! I can't wait to get there. And when he says, could you show Derek his room? Can you imagine that? I mean, I'm going to live in the house of the king, and I'm down here hanging my head over what somebody done to me instead of rejoicing over what the God who made the universe has done for me. What does it matter? Well, I'm letting Satan set my value instead of God. So if you're here this morning, let your shame stay at the foot of the cross. It's been paid for. Regret and guilt are when do they accompany shame. And you might have come in here this morning carrying some serious shame and serious regret and serious guilt. But I want to tell you something. Just as precious as what you receive at the cross is what Jesus has offered to let you leave there. And this morning, if you've got shame and guilt and regret, won't you give it to the one who paid for it? He paid for it. It's his, right? The Bible said he become your shame. What are you packing it for? He become your regret. What are you packing it for? It says he despised the shame of the cross, but he bore it. Whoo, I like that part. But maybe this morning, maybe it's, maybe it's a little different than that. Maybe this morning that your brokenness it's a little farther deeper in spiritual terms than that. Maybe today your brokenness is over fear. Anybody ever just been completely broken over fear? We got two hands. Let me put that a little different. <laughs> Do you believe that you've ever robbed yourself of the joy and the peace and the hope that God wanted to give you because you were more focused on your fear than your father? That's a little closer, right? But I want to tell you something. Every hand in this room ought to own that one. Folks, I want to tell you something. We are so accustomed to fear. And fear robs us of our joy and our peace and our hope. And it brings about a brokenness that's really, really unnecessary. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you something this morning. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not telling you this is easy. I'm inviting you this morning. I'm inviting you to do something. I'm inviting you to lighten your load. I want to tell you something about worry. I want you to put this in your mind. Worry is the most effortless, I mean the profitless effort the human body's ever performed. I'm going to say that again without stuttering. Worry is the most profitless effort the human body has ever performed. Nothing has ever been changed by worry. Jesus said you can't change a second of your life by worrying. Now I'm going to ask you a question. How many people have ever worried sick about something and it really happened the way you worried it would? It may have flew apart, but it didn't look like you thought it was going to. Right? Our worries never come true. Now, we might have things to worry about, but God said, confess them unto me. Give them unto me and let me worry about them. I'm big enough. I can do this thing. You trust your worries to me. Jesus said, you seek first the kingdom of heaven, and I'll deal with that. That's what he said. All them other things I'll take care of. I'll, I'll give what you need. You just focus on me. But here's the thing. And I've noticed this in my life. My worries, my fears, and we're going to talk about a big A word here in a little bit. Anxiety. It is the new word in our society. We draw it like a gun. That's right. I can't do that. Lord, have mercy. It gives me anxiety. Right? Now, anxiety is now the new crutch for society. It's so much the crutch that we have pain clinics now, but on the rise behind pain clinics is anxiety clinics. Now, I'm not a mental expert, so you can argue with me over this, but pain is never the problem. Pain is actually a symptom of the problem, right? 
if you hit your finger with a hammer, the pain is not the problem. The pain is a sign that you hit the wrong thing. You have officially missed your mark. You know that tingly feeling that makes you get weak in the knees and you want to puke when something like that happens? Words come out of your mouth that you should have retained. You, you know, if you follow me, right? The, you get weak in the knees and tears come down your face. And that is the result of pain. But pain was not the problem. The problem was you are a bad aim. You feel? So pain was a symptom, not the problem. Anxiety itself, if you will follow me from it, is a symptom of your focus being in the wrong place. Anxiety. Anxiety is a, is, is, a, is, a, is a it's a it's a problem. No, it's not a problem. It's a symptom that my focus is on the wrong place. If David would have been looking at how big Goliath was, he'd been right up there with the rest of them. Man, I want you to think about something. Goliath was nine foot nine inches tall. That's tall, right? But you've ever seen them big tall folk that's real skinny and goofy and not very intimidating, this is not Goliath. Not only was he nine foot nine inches tall, but the tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. The tip. Do you imagine the kind of pipes it takes to hold up a spear that the tip of it weighs 15 pounds, real less to throw that thing? On top of that, Goliath's title is the champion. You know how you get to be a champion in Goliath's sport? There's no rematches. That guy will never ask for one because he's no longer with us. You understand? Goliath's a champion. He's never faced anybody that's complained about it. They're dead. Everybody else is up there saying, do you know who that is? And David said, do you know who God is? And I love, I want you to listen to his, I mean, some of the little things in the Bible come so simple. Listen to what David said. David didn't walk in there and say, hey, look here, Doc. You send me down there, because I don't know if you know it or yet or not, but I'm a bad mamma jamma. You send me down there, and you'll have no more problems with this guy, because it'd be off with his head. No, no, David walked in there and said, I don't understand why we're sitting up here letting this uncircumcised Philistine defy the army of the living God. And listen to these words. He said, God gave me the lion and the bear. There ain't no problem in him giving me this Philistine. This guy's a chump. He's a bunch of wind. Now, he's a big guy, but my God's a big God. Folks, how many times have we been robbed of our victory because we're struggling with fear? And here's the thing. We want to act like we ain't afraid of nothing. Right? Oh, man. You know those people. Those people who walk cocky, but somebody could yell boo when they jump out of their skin. You know what I'm talking about, right? They got the cocky walk down. They're tough. Hey? In their mind, Buford Pusser's just another name. <laughs> Till they hear a loud noise. Right? And we want to put that on in our spirit. I love the song that John Cooper sings. And you, I don't know if you know who John Cooper is or not, but he's the lead singer of the band Skillet. Now, for a long time, I had some ill-gotten thoughts about Skillet because I didn't understand a word they sang. Right? But, but then God straightened me right out on that, and I began to understand this man's heart. And then they sung some songs where I can actually understand the words, which made me love them a lot. You know what I mean? they famous for Ooga Jugga Booga songs. You know what I'm talking about there. But they sung some songs that's actually got English words in it. And one of them, he says this, If we're going to stand, let's stand like giants. And if we're going to walk, let's walk like lions. Now, we went to the zoo. 
Do you know the tiger is actually a kind of a, he's a bigger cat than the lion. And so I've always been kind of confused at why the lion gets to be the king and the tiger ain't. Until we got to the exhibit. And there's a big shade tree laying over there and there's a tiger under it. All four feet up there. Passed out, coat and a wedge. And then we went to the lion's exhibit. And there's a lion, and you, they won't even, I mean, at the tiger, you can look at the tiger like from here to Ricky. When you go to the lion's exhibit, you're standing way up in there, and he's way down in the hole, you know what I mean? There's a reason for that. He never stops walking. I sit there and watch him walk, and every time he walks, the muscles in his back blew my mind. I mean, that, that thing is a machine. And there's a reason why in his mind. He fears nothing because he was created that way. God spoke, and he was. And I want to tell you something. He walks like a lion. And, folks, the Bible says that he that's in me is greater than he that's in the world. I think that's 1 John 1, 9, I think. I want you to put that verse in your mind. 1 John 1, 9, I believe, is the verse. And it says, understand this, Jesus is over, he's, we've over, he's overcome the world. And he that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. Now, what's that mean to you? What's that mean? He that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. Do, do you walk like something in you is greater than he that's in the world? Do you walk like a lion? Because there's been some times... I haven't walked too much like my God's a big God. Are you, can you own that guilt? There's been some times that I have walked in fear rather than in faith. Maybe you're here this morning and you've got a major anxiety with doubt. Oh, Lord. How, who would like to stand up in front of the church and confess I'm a doubter? It's like when we come to church, we're supposed to be faith giants, right? And so the last thing we're going to say to anybody is, I got doubts. But I want to tell you, all up in here, there's doubts. All up in here, I struggle with doubts all the time. You remember that guy that came to Jesus with his demon-possessed son? The disciples, they couldn't do nothing for him. And Jesus brought his, he brought his little boy over to Jesus, and he said, If you can do anything for him, please do it. And Jesus said, If you can, with God all things are possible. I love this guy. This is one of my favorite guys in Scripture. He says, I do believe, but could you help me with my unbelief? I want to tell you something. Maybe you're here this morning and you got some anxiety that's really keeping you from rejoicing in God. And maybe you're here this morning and you got some doubts that's really keeping you rejoicing in God. You know what else is cool? I, I told Debbie that a year ago, the challenge to the church to remember. I had no idea she was going to say it today. But I want you to put up on the wall, if you would, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 7. I want you to listen to this verse right here. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Let me ask you something. How pretty is your anxiety? How pretty is the fact that you walk around like a wimp instead of like a lion in the faith? How pretty is the fact that you struggle with doubt when God's given you no reason to doubt? How pretty is the fact that you struggle with shame of what other people's done to you or what you've done for yourself? And you're scared to death somebody will find it. That ain't very pretty, is it? And God says, when you bring it to me, I want you to bring it all. And I want you to cast it on me. Notice he didn't say give it to me a little bit at a time. I don't know if I can take it or not. He said, just lay her down there. Just throw your junk down there. And I want to tell you something. Some people call me and they ask me questions like this. I don't know how to do that. If you're here this morning and you don't know how to do that, you're in good company. Because that right there is something that only the Holy Spirit can help you do. Your job is to be willing to leave the junk at the altar. Not, not, not saying capable, I'm saying willing. And you got to lay it down until you don't pick it back up 
anymore. It's a process. You understand? It's a process of having a mended, broken heart. Jesus don't just sew it back together one minute and you're off to the races the rest of your life and never need Jesus again. No, you're going to spend the rest of your life needing Jesus to mend your broken heart. And when he does that, as only he can do, then he's going to give you a testimony that you're wanting to go so bad to tell somebody else. Now, I'm going to tell you something this morning. I, I'm going to close with a testimony. And then I'm going to close with one passage of Scripture, and I'm going to leave it in your hand. I am not where I want to be. But I am so thankful that I'm not where I used to be. Now, Sin, yes, I'm so thankful that I'm not in the sin that I used to be in because it was destroying me, sucking the life out of me like a leech. What I thought was enjoyable and fun and what I thought took the edge off, it was kind of like a relief valve for me. If you're here and you've ever struggled with addiction, that's what addiction kind of does for everybody. It's kind of like a relief valve. One, uh, you'd cut one arm off never to do it again and cut the other one off to do it one more time. Because it kind of like makes the world go away for a moment. And as soon as you do it again, you hate yourself for doing it. Now, if you're here and you struggle with that, I'm getting pretty close to home. You hate it. But you do it because uh, it's like Satan is screaming in your ear with everything he has. He's screaming and driving you crazy and you could beat your head against that wall right there. And I've pretty much done such things. I mean, I have laid on the floor of my house and screamed with everything I had. Looked like somebody that has totally lost their mind. My wife can attest to such things. I have, I mean, I've been praying to God so loud that the neighbors could probably hear about half mad. And don't even know why. Because it's not God that's failing, it's me. And I know I need to give it to him, but I don't know how. If I'm getting a little closer to home. I've been so frustrated at myself at night because I'm laying there worrying about something I know I can't fix instead of going to sleep and letting it be in his hands. And I know I need to let him have it, but I don't know how. I'm getting a little closer to home, right? I doubt him when I know I have no reason to doubt him. But I want to tell you something. God has begun to do something in my life. And I thought this morning before I shared this, I said, Derek, are you sure you want to share that? Because Satan's probably going to wear you out after you do. That's dumb. You're going to be putting a big bullseye on your back to say what you're about to say. That's dumb. And the only reason I'm saying it this morning is because I'm praying, and I am praying that you can be set free as I have begun to experience being set free. But I, have, I was so crazy to believe that there were things in my life, if God took them away, I don't know if I could take it. I have always been afraid of failure. And I have always liked my comforts. I like home. I like doing what I love to do what I do. And, and it's been always been a, a scare, even if, you know, what if disaster took it all away? What if trauma took it all away? What if, what, what if everything goes bad? What if I lose everything I got? What if God called me to a ministry God forbid in Chicago or something. You think about that. I mean, if I, if it, God, I would just soon him call me to prison. Now, if you're from Chicago, I ain't knocking it. But then again, I guess I am. I told my wife when we got married, we was driving through a big city, and I said, honey, me and you may end up in a shack in a cedar thicket, but we'll never end up here. You know what I mean? Because that's my mentality. And so I, I'm afraid that God's going to put me in a place that's going to be uncomfortable. What if I lose the thing that I don't want to lose? What if I get that phone call and one of my kids is dead? What if I get that phone call and I've lost my job? What if, what if I don't get the big job? What if I got bills I can't pay? you got those kinds of lists in your head going on and on and on. What ifs, what ifs. And Satan just keeps making the list longer and longer and longer. And he reminds you of it all night long. And I have realized something. Paul said, I have learned a secret to contentment. And folks, I had no idea what that word meant. 
But God has been giving me an education on that word. I have learned the secret to being contentment. I can do whatever I have to do as long as Christ gives me strength. If I am drawing my strength from the Father and I am connected with Him and I am focused on Him and I am living for Him, then I can live in an uncomfortable situation and rejoice because I've learned how to be content even if the situation doesn't look contentment. I have learned how to live with a little and I've learned how to be humble with a lot. I can do whatever I got to do if He's my contentment. If he's my strength. I want to ask you something this morning. Are you living for Jesus for you? Peyton said something I could have jumped up and gave that girl a hug for. She tried to get saved for somebody else other than her. She'd done it because it was the right thing to do. I want to straighten up for my wife. If I don't straighten up, the old lady's going to leave my high now. And people say stuff like that. If I don't straighten up, my mama's putting me in rehab. If I don't straighten up, I'm going to end up in a pen. All those things sound good, but folks, you can't straighten up for them reasons. The only reason you can straighten up is for a broken and contrite heart when you realize that what I have done is offended the living God. And I have denied the only reason I have to exist. And I want to go home. Now I'm going to say something right here and this is what this is what I I want to be very cautious about I, I, do you know the name Lauren Daigle anybody know her name she's come under a lot of scrutiny here lately about her style of music and her style of writing and anyway I'm not here I'm not, I'm not promoting or condemning Laura Daigle but her song that I'm about to say when I hear the words it brings tears ultimately to my eyes that fast because it's like my soul has already heard it before I've lived the song I mean, this song is me. And I want you to listen to this song. It says, I've seen love come and I've seen love walk away. So many questions. Will anybody stay? It's been a hard year. So many nights in tears. All of the darkness trying to fight my fears. Alone. So long alone. I don't know where I'd be if I didn't know you. I'd probably fall off the edge. I don't know where I'd go if you ever let go. So keep me held in your hands. I've started breathing. This is, this is beginning with the victory part. I've started breathing now. I've started breathing. The weight is lifted here. With you it's easy. My head is finally clear. There's nothing missing when you are my, by my side. I took, the wrong, I took the long road, but now I realize, listen to this line right here, I'm home with you, I'm home. Golly, I've, read, I've lived that life. I took the long road. It took me so long to realize that my peace and my joy and my hope, my promised land, my comfort, my rock, my home is not in a box that I call a house or a place that I call mine. But when you're with me, I get it now. I'm beginning to get it. My contentment is in you. There's, hey, listen here. It says, I don't know where I'd be if I didn't know you. I'd probably fall off the edge. I don't know where I'd go if you ever let go, so keep me held in your hands. You are my safe place and my hideaway. You're my anchor and my saving grace. You're my constant. You're my oxygen. And I don't know where I'd go if I didn't have you. I want to ask you something this morning. Do you know God that way? You know, some people, they, they got all kinds of cur critiquing, commentary on what's going on over here. But I'm asking about you. It, it ain't about Laura this morning. It ain't about me. It ain't about the person behind you or in front of you. As a matter of fact, I want to take you all the way back to the beginning of the Bible with Adam and Eve. Adam looked at Eve, and Eve looked at Adam right after they bit the apple, and they both went, <gasps> for the first time ever. You realize before they bit that fruit that they had absolutely no understanding of their shame? You remember when your kids could get naked anywhere? 
You, do you remember it? I mean, honest to God, do you remember it? I'm, I'm serious here. I remember when our kids was a little embarrassed. Me today, if I'd look around, one of them would be stark naked, walking right down the middle of everybody, proud as a peacock. <laughs> and I'd be over there trying to wrap something around them. Lord, my God. We was at a motel somewhere, and I looked up the hall and seen this little brown butt way up in front of me. <laughs> and it was my daughter. <laughs> and I couldn't get there fast enough. And people, I mean, people hung their doors up and going, you know what I mean? And really and truly you're saying, what are you doing naked? But you can't help but love the fact that they're so innocent. They don't know what all the fuss is about. You mean you never get naked? I mean, they don't understand. You keep your clothes on at all times. How do you shower? You know, they don't get it, right? We have shame that they don't have. And Adam and Eve, they realized they were naked. And you know what they did? You know what they did. They made themselves by their best effort a garment. Now, this is the cool part, and you've got to get this part. They got on the first ever attire. And man, Adam's back out there with Eve, and Eve's back out there with Adam, and nobody's blushing or acting goofy or anything. Everybody's all cool. They got on their fig leaves. And they hear God coming. And you know what they do? They hide. Do you understand the, the jive here? They hide even though they've already done the best they could to cover their shame to one another. They know he knows. I mean, why else would they be wearing fig leaves? And God says something phenomenally here. This, this is an all-knowing God who's about to ask this question. Where are you? Folks, let me ask you something. Why did God ask that? He knows exactly where they are. But he has just set Adam up for repentance. And so I'm going to ask you this morning, where are you? Are you robbed of your joy and peace because of shame and guilt and regret? Are you weighed down and robbed of a true Christian walk in peace and joy because of anxiety and fear and worry? Has anxiety become your crutch and it's your reason you can't do everything? It's because, God, it makes me anxious. Because the Bible says don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition make your request to God and He will give you the peace that transcends all understanding so how in the world can I say God that gives me anxiety he said yeah but I give you peace in your anxiety who are you focused on here now this morning we're going to have a hymn of invitation I'm going to invite you to do something I'm on and now listen to me now I know everybody wants to get out of here because this went a long time let me ask you something what in the world you got to do more important right now than getting yourself right with the God that's going to judge you what do you got to do more important than leaving here at peace inside yourself? And so I'm going to invite you. Everybody gets all weirded out and coming to the front. But if you, live led, if you feel led to come to the front, then you better do it because you ain't going to have no peace otherwise. So if you feel led to come to the altar this morning, if you ain't never come, I want you to come. And if somebody in here makes fun of you, when you walk out, I'll go with you. But if you're sitting where you are, God can hear you just fine. I ask you to get real and tell God what is keeping you from where he wants you to be. Because you know, if the Holy Spirit's nagged on that old heart during this service, you know if your anxiety's standing in your way, you know if doubt's standing in your way, you know if sin and shame and unconfessed sin, unrepented sin. I want you to confess and ask God to heal your unbelief, to heal you of your fear and anxiety. I want you to ask God to help you lay your shame at his feet. I want you to ask God to show himself to you if you just wished you could see him, but you never have. If you don't believe yet, but you want to real bad, then I'm asking you to ask God, Lord, I want to believe. Help me believe. Help me trust you as the Lord of my life. Won't you come today as we sing our invitation hymn?